the past few sessions has been the 20th chapter of Revelation. Today we're going to start out with verse 12. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. Who are these that St. John saw? They are every one that has ever lived on the face of this earth. Great men, rich men, important people, little people, poor people, insignificant people, small and great, it makes no difference. There is going to be a day of judgment. And if you have not known it in the past, I hope you know it now. If you can say nobody ever told you, you can never say it again. There is going to be a judgment day, and you and I are going to be there. We're going to stand before God in judgment. Oh, yes, but we are. We have nothing to say about that, because it's something that God has decided. Now, you can circulate in a free society and within reasonable restrictions you can do anything you want to until you run afoul of the law. Then they put you in hold and they say your judgment day is next Tuesday or whatever. Are you going to be there? You better believe you're going to be there and not because you want to either. You're going to be there because it's been decided for you. Now they may have to drag you in there kicking and screaming but you will come up for judgment because it's been determined. God has determined a day of judgment. Man has been given an appointment once to die, one chance to live in this world and do whatever he's going to do until he dies, and after that, the judgment. It is appointed unto man. We are going to keep that appointment. God has enforcers known as angels. They know exactly where you are, and they're charged with getting you there on time. Matthew 13, 41, 42 says, The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them that do iniquity. And he shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. We will make an appearance before God in judgment. And what's going to happen? What's going to happen at that judgment? Well, there are some books there which are going to be open. What are these books that are going to be open? These books contain the deeds of every person who ever lived in this world. Everything that they ever did, the Bible is clear on it. Now, this was known to men in the early times of history. In Job 14, verses 16 through 22, Job lamented that God wrote terrible things about him in the book. God brought up to him the irresponsibility of his youth. He never let Job get away with anything, and God never forgets anything. God narrowly scrutinized the path that he walked in this earth and put lines on the bottom of his feet so that he could keep track in his book of every place that Job put his heel down on the ground. Job had a print on his feet that identified him, and God watched for it. He knew every place that Job's foot had touched in this world. So said Job. In Malachi 3, in verses 16 through 18, God writes up a book of remembrance. In that book, he recorded the name of those that feared him along with their thoughts. This book will make it possible for God to distinguish between the righteous and the wicked, according to verse 18. Now, Jesus taught commonly about this event. In St. Luke's Gospel, chapter 8 and verse 17, he said, For nothing is secret that shall not be made manifest, neither anything hid that shall not be known and come abroad. In Luke 12, 2 and 3, Jesus said, For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid 
that shall not be known. Therefore, whatsoever ye have spoken in darkness shall be heard in light, and that which ye have spoken in the ear in the closets shall be proclaimed from the housetops. St. Paul wrote in Romans, the second chapter, in verse 5 and verse 17, about the day of the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. And he talked about men treasuring up wrath against that day of wrath and that revelation of that righteous judgment in the day when God would reveal the secrets of men's hearts. In Revelation chapter 3 and verse 5, Jesus took a book of life having to do with sanctification and faithfulness in the kingdom of God. And he talked to this church about it. There's a danger of God's people having their names blotted out of that book through dereliction. This is not speaking of justification nor warning that God's children could be lost to him eternally. It means something quite different as the context indicates and as we discussed at the time. It's talking in the sense of someone being fired from his job for carelessness and irresponsibility. It's like an athlete being kicked off the team for failing to listen to the coach and to train properly. This imagery and warning is issued again in Hebrews 12 and verse 13. To stay in God's employ in the kingdom takes dedication and singleness of heart. As Romans eleven, nineteen through 21 warns, God will not hesitate to break branches off the tree that are dead and that are not producing fruit. Now this again is not threatening us with the loss of justification, but addressing the subject of the harvest field, the war in righteousness, the need for every servant who is accepted for the work to do his part, and God's intolerance of deliberate and prolonged laziness and indifference. God talked to the church at Sardis about how they might behave so that their names would not be blotted out of the book of life. It's important to understand that from the beginning of time, God has made it clear he is writing up a book. We have computers now in which a chip the size of your little fingernail and maybe smaller can hold millions and billions of pieces of data. Oh, this is very clever without a doubt. But God has a book that records every thought and every deed of every person that has ever lived. The books were opened and all of these deeds are brought to light. Now after the books are opened, another book is opened. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. What is going on here? And it's really very simple and straightforward. I will tell you what is happening so that you need not be confused. When someone's name is found in the books, a search is made to see if that name is in the book of life. In Luke 10, verse 20, Jesus told his disciples that having your name written in heaven is more important than anything else in life, even the power to do miracles. That is the first and most important issue of life, But it doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop there. When the name of the individual is found in the book of life, then a search is made of the books to see how many of his works, his deeds, that are written in the books are found in the book of life. Those that are found, the works of the Spirit that are done in Christ, are preserved for all eternity. Those that are not found in the book of life are cast into the lake of fire to be destroyed. No, your carnal works are not going to live on in some sort of detached and independent eternal suffering. They're going to be burned up and destroyed. That's what's going on here. 
2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verses 9 through 11, the apostle said, Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also manifest in your conscience. Now you may want to reply that your church has told you that this passage, 2 Corinthians 5, 9-11, is spoken to unbelievers. If so, I feel for you and for your leaders who must someday give an account for having so badly misled you. But that cannot change the evident fact that this is a message to the church and you may as well face up to it now while you can do something about it because you're going to have to someday. In Colossians chapter 3 and verses 23 through 25, the apostle tells the church, And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of your inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done. And there is no respect of persons. Again, he warns the church in Galatians 6 and verses 7 through 9, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. If you think that just because you're a Christian saved by grace, you're going to make a fool of God, you had best think again. Now, you may think that you have God in a trap because of his love and his grace, but he does not think so. Does anybody want to put any money on the outcome of this argument? Even more defining words are used by the apostle in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 11 through 18. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build on this foundation, here's the church building on the foundation of Christ. If any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereon, he shall receive a reward. But if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seem to be wise in this world, let him become a fool, that he may be wise. You're a Christian and you're building on the foundation of Christ. But be careful that you build of the right stuff. Be careful what you build and be careful how you build. You could wind up in the day of the Lord justified and nothing more according to this passage. What will be left of your life 
when the fires of God's judgment get through with it. Hebrews 10 verses 26 through 31 address the church about the very issue of sanctification. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sorer punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, and I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Pay no attention to those who try to argue that this is not written to the church. These kinds of mindless twistings of the scripture have nothing to add to the discussion or to the critical issues that face us. Verses 32 to 34 go on to make it clear that it cannot possibly be to anyone but the church. What does it mean to tell the non-Christian but call to remembrance the former days in in which after you were illuminated you endured a great fight of affliction partly while you were made a gazing stock both by reproaches and afflictions and partly whilst you became companions of them that were so used For you had compassion of me and my bonds, and you took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. Hebrews 12, 6-29 puts this matter in words that cannot be added to. Looking diligently, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as he saw, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For you know how that afterwards when he would have inherited the blessing he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. For you are not come to the mount that might be touched and burned with fire, nor into the blackness and the darkness and the tempest, And the sound of the trumpet and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them any more, for they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. But ye are come unto the Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly of the church and the firstborn which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of the sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. See that ye refuse not him that speaketh, For if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape. If we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore we, receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably, with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming 